Okay. Okay, we're going. Okay, so we're with uh, Pat Thomas here, and it's Alexander Lawrence, the Portable Infinite, and uh, we're this is interview twenty one. You know, believe it. You know, we, you know, we get everybody, and we get them up many times. So let's see. Um, okay, so Pat Thomas is the author of Listen, Whitey, The Sounds of Black pa pa Power, 1965-75, Did It, Jerry Rubin, An American Revolutionary. And I, I've read books. Um, you did a book by uh, uh, Lou Reed Interviews. That's right. And which is, which is great. And um, I read that recently. It was one of my top books of that year. How Thank long, you. When did that come out? I can't, you know, I can't remember anymore, but I'm going to say about three years ago. Okay, yeah, that sounds about right. And then yeah. and then the new book is called Material Wealth, Mining the Personal Archive of Allen Ginsberg. And uh, I've known, like, uh, you know, everyone, you know, like I've known Pat since the 80s. And yeah, I went to high school with, with Teresa Blasey, so I've known her even longer. And we had another mutual friend, Randy Fritch, who was... Oh, yeah. He was in the, he was in a band, right? The McGuire's. In the McGuire's, okay, yeah, I, yeah. I, I just kind of reconnected with him recently. So, and Randy cool. Rich is working in uh, music publishing now, and he's uh, he's still around. Yeah, he is. I talk to him often. Yeah, and when when did you meet him? I met him. I had just moved to San Francisco, and I was performing with my own little folk trio called Pat Thomas, basically. And Steve Wynn was a good friend from the Dream Center. He came up and I opened for him. And uh, Randy and Teresa were there and Randy came up and introduced himself. Oh, okay. And uh, about a week later, I went to his apartment, um, met Teresa and uh, Teresa wound up as, you know, become my roommate for a few years. And uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I haven't talked to Teresa in years. It's been about yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a while too. Like I haven't maybe over twenty years for me too. But um, but yeah. I remember coming when you lived on Fell. That's I remember, right. I remember coming to your house and waking up in the morning and jamming with uh, Sonia. Um, what's her Sonia name? Hunter. So Sonia Hunter and like I didn't even know who she was and I'm jamming in the in the in the <laughs> kitchen. Good you know, with, a, with a two string guitar and um. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Pat Pat Thomas. I mean, we're almost like the exact same age. He's like exactly a month older than me. Both born in '64. Yeah, April 6th. I'm May 6th. Cool. And um, he's like this kind of like East Coast doppelganger, you know, because like he he <laughs> interviewed Allen Ginsberg in '84, which would have been like a lot cooler because I waited till '95 to interview him. Uh -huh. and then, and then he he was sort of involved in the punk scene, and he was also interested in um, the Paisley Underground. And you yeah, know, one of the first gigs I went to, I mean, well, I guess I've been to a bunch of gigs, but I saw Dream Syndicate like maybe their fourth gig when they opened up the Psychedelic Furs at the Seven. Oh wow, cool! So I saw them real early, and I definitely saw Salvation Army three o'clock in the early days. And I was even in a, a Bell Jar, which was kind of like a. Um, Pays the underground um, mm -hmm. influence band and stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah. like we we, we we have a lot of the same cultural references and and he he's done all these. I mean, much more. I mean, I did a lot of these books about Grove Press and Barney Rossett. He's done books about the uh, the Black Panthers and Jerry Rubin and Lou Reed and and, and these guys. And so on, I got to hit the pause button there. Tell me about your uh, Grove Press Barney Rossett book, because I'm I'm doing one. <laughs> oh, uh, well, it's right. <laughs> well, have it the, off the well, shelf. The first one I worked on. This is like the first book that I worked on was the Grove Press number. With oh, I have that. You worked on that. That's yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And we yeah we interviewed all the City Lights guys. Hold on, hold on. I think I got my copy right here. One second. Look at this. How often does this happen? In <laughs> yeah, it was a trip. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah look, I'm, 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 I'm in the, uh, the, uh, yeah. Well, Gintarski, um, yeah, Gintarski, like, is the main author. He, right. was a, he was a professor of mine at Long Beach State. And that, and I did an interview with him uh, just a couple months ago. I, um, I interviewed him about a year ago over the same topic. Wow. Yeah. So, well, you look at, yeah, look, SD Gintarski and then, Editorial, I'm like right there, right under. Fantastic, the brother! Wow, 
so and then so uh, and i and i spent a lot of, when i lived in new york in the 90s i spent a lot of time with barney this was kind of like my entry into the uh the That's whole crazy. scene yeah because like when uh yeah so um and wow. so like when for, coming from that book we interviewed we did this big interview with sorrentino and it was first the uh, audio interview and then sorrentino rewrote it but i was aware that um that Ginsburg around that same time, this is this is mostly like 89, 90, not not too close to when I met you. Uh yeah. Ginsburg had a Ginsburg collected everything, you know. Yes, he did. That's how my book came together. <laughs> and he sold that I don't know when the exact date is. I'm guessing 85 to Stanford. Oh, late later, more like more like 90, but I can't say for oh, sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. I say the same era. And yeah, so, same like era. I think. Because I was friends with um, Gil Sorrentino, who was teaching at Stanford, mm -hmm. and his son Chris, who lived in San Francisco. Like, like Gil was like saying, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna start collecting everything and you know get my million dollar payday and stuff." But Ginsburg, I mean, there was a, I mean, how many boxes of stuff was he collecting? He was a, he was the guy that collected everything. I th I think there were like ten thousand boxes. Something wow. Like yeah, because he didn't, Ginsburg didn't throw anything away. He kept every letter, every receipt, and, and he meticulously filed them. And then, of course, when Stanford got them, they meticulously refiled. And so what the way my book came together called Material Wealth, it's really based on all the material that's at Stanford. So what I did is I went through the catalog online, and I said I'd like boxes, you know, 7, 12, 52, 103. And then me and Peter Hale from the Ginsburg estate and a friend of ours named Jim O'Thomas, we just were there for like four or five days and would just pull the items that we found the most interesting. And, and some of the items are wacky. For example, at one point, the American Nazi party wanted to assassinate Ginsburg for being a gay commie Jew. And so he wrote to them and said, let's get together and talk about this, right? <laughs> You know? wow. like only Ginsburg would do that right there's also uh an amazing transcript of a 1971 phone call between him and Henry Kissinger debating the Vietnam War there's a 1974 ticket stub from Madison Square Garden when the band and Dylan reunited and uh he scribbled Yoko Ono's home phone number on the back uh you know there's just a lot of funny cool weird stuff uh, Ginsburg's notes on hearing Dylan's blood on the tracks for the first time. Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah, just um, great stuff. Yeah, yeah, the, um, yeah. I guess Peter. I mean, because um, I mean, we we've done. I've done the magazines I worked with. We did so many um, Ginsburg, Burroughs things. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Hale's a name that comes up quite a bit with dealing with Ginsburg. What? Uh, what's... Yeah, Peter Hale's kind of my unofficial co-author. He 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 really greenlighted this for me and was my cheerleader you know he he kind of let me do whatever i wanted but he was there behind the scenes like you know go cat go uh you know which was great so so this book is uh kind of like a um uh grab bag it's a um like um you know what it's like if there if there it's like you know when you go to a to a museum and they're and they and they've devoted four floors to one artist like you know this is the picasso thing and then you get the what they call the exhibition catalog you know, for 50 bucks as you're walking out the door. That's what this is. This is like an exhibition catalog for for a gallery opening that didn't happen, right? Uh, it's a very visual book, lots of photographs, and then lots of photographs that we took of items, you know, like these letter letters. Um, yeah, so it's, and then I tell a lot of little cool anecdotes, you know, Mainly when people think of Ginsburg, they also think of Jack Kerouac and William Burroughs. And there's plenty of that in here. But I go deep on Bob Dylan, uh, Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman and the Yippies, Paul McCartney, uh, you know, other things that aren't always connected to uh, Ginsburg's and other books, you know. So so I met I met a lot of the uh, Beats uh, living in San Francisco, like, you know, Gregory Corso, Ginsburg, of course, mm -hmm. uh, uh uh, Ferlin Getty, because I lived in North Beach. I used to see him at Cafe Greco. Oh, uh, yeah. The, met real briefly. I met uh, Philip Lamantia, John Wheeler. Oh, yeah. And, you know, some of the guys that you don't see. 
and uh, Michael McClure and uh, Diane DePrima, a few of uh, and Ferlin Getty just died in the last two or three years. And that's um, right. That's right. I guess. Yeah. I yeah, guess these, it's, yeah, these, that, folks, these uh, folks are all in there, but I just like another cool thing that's in there is the uh, the famous writer Terry Southern rewrote right. Howl, rewrote a parody of Howell called Towel. Right oh there. right, right. Yeah, that's really good. Well, no, I was just gonna say, um, I, yeah. well, um, the the Gary Snyder is like the only beat still alive, and so so when you go to people that are kind of close to the beats, I mean, Ann Waldman and maybe um the poet um Andy um what does it like, mm -hmm. uh, I forgot his last name um, but uh you know Ann Waldman you he, he start going to the people from the forties like Ann Waldman and. And, and so, right. so she wrote the inter introduction um, to this yeah, book. Anne, yeah, Anne wrote the introduction to this book, which I was really grateful for, because she gives it an extra degree of credibility, not only as a sort of beat, but also one of Ginsburg's closest uh, associates. You know, they ran that Jack Kerouac school of disembodied poetics together. So, um, like, going back to Ginsburg's poetry and stuff, like, um, you know, I like the, the, the early stuff, the howl up into mm -hmm. Planet News. I think like the seventies. I think he was more involved in teaching and politics and stuff. So, yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm not so much of a fan of the seventies uh, material as much. But, but uh, in '84 he did collected poems and White Shroud in '86, and so that's around the time you interviewed him. So I, I think he had kind of a rent, and I think the Beats had a the Beats were kind of like, you know, unless you went to um, uh, Naropa. They were, you know, they were kind of under the radar for in the seventies, kind of generally, and then they kind of made this comeback about eighty five. They did. That's that? a good. That's a really good point. Around eighty five, it's it's sort of like you know some of Kerouac's books had been out of print. They went back into print. There was a big conference uh, at Naropa, fifty years of on the road. Ginsburg started touring a lot. He came to a lot of colleges. Uh, he would read poetry. He would even sing songs. Uh, yeah, the eighties. The eighties was a good time, and most of these guys were still alive then. Of course, you know. And, and so, uh, when you did the interview with them, what what were, what were you kind of focusing on? Were you focused on the politics or the no, literature? I, I, my interview from the from eighty four is actually at the very end of my book, and it's really about you know King Crimson had just done an album called Beat. Oh right, right. And they had a song called Neil and Jack and Me. Um, he didn't like it. He didn't really like it. It wasn't weird. <laughs> um, um, you know, the, the Grateful Dead, of course, were still going and they used to sing a song called Cassidy about, Neil, you know, so it was really his opinions about rock and roll connected. The, of course, he had recently, two years earlier, had sang with The Clash on Combat Rock. Well, what, what, what do you think of uh, Ginsburg? I mean, he used to do the music with the harmonium and um, he would occasionally to collaborate what do you what do you think of his music output his music career I, I like it look i understand why people don't like it i find it extremely charming and cool and weird but i i you know it's a little it's an acquired taste like some people don't like nico doing the same thing right from the above and underground she would do harmonium stuff i find it kind of cool also there's a strong eastern you know kind of indian religion mysticism spiritualism in a lot of ginsburg's music especially with the harmonium so it gives it almost a neo-psychedelic flavor even though he might not be in intentionally doing that so uh let's talk about some other characters that pop up in this book i guess uh patty smith's kind of a big deal there's a lot of crossover she, even before she was kind of famous they were just kind of she worked at a bookstore in new york she was around yeah uh, oh yeah jim, jim carroll uh what's going on there with the yeah there was a patty smith poster or something going yeah there. well you know ginsburg quickly realized that patty was the next generation and ginsburg i don't even think i can't say this for a fact but i'm pretty sure patty didn't even save the poster from her first ever poetry reading in 1971 but ginsburg did <laughs> uh, oh yeah that's it that's it okay that, that's what that poster yeah i yeah. think I mean, I watched a lot. I mean, I, I write some poetry myself, and uh, you know, I'm uh, in, I was. What, what did you? Where you went to school? Like in Syracuse or where? Where? Well, I, I grew up around Rochester. Oh, okay. Uh, New York. But speaking of school, when I was in my forties, I decided to go back to school. I, oh, okay. I moved. I moved. I went to Evergreen State University in Olympia. 
Okay. All right. Right. Yeah. You told me. Home of K Records, right? That's yeah. That's like the hippie school. No grades over there. Yeah. No grades. Hippie school. And then about two years ago, I got my MFA in nonfiction writing here in LA from Antioch University. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I was just saying that I was an English major, so uh, I would go to these readings, and I think the best re readers were Ginsburg, Patty Smith, and Jim Carroll. I think. I don't know. What, what do you I, think? I would agree because those three were expressive. They, you know, they were as good as well. Patty, of course, became a rock singer, but you know, they they had a real rock and roll visceral element. You know, just like Joe Strummer, uh, Dylan, to some degree. You know, because there's nothing worse than someone reading their poetry and they sound bored with their own words, right? In fact, another thing we may have in common in recent years, I started hanging out at Beyond Baroque in Venice. Um, which is where Patty started. Uh, well, she started in New York, but when she'd come to LA, she would be there. The, you know, John Doe and Xene met there, and that was the beginnings of X. Tom Waits used to hang out there. Uh, if if oh. if your readers, listeners don't know about Beyond Baroque, it's still kind of a counterculture beatnik hub. Well, know? I interviewed uh, Dennis Cooper and Jack Skelly, or who were kind of part of that. The the eighties, the seventies and eighties scene. Yeah, Wanda Coleman came out of there. Yeah, yeah. The and then uh, yeah, David Trinidad, Amy Gersler. There's a lot of great writing that coming out of there. Okay, so getting back to your book, I mean, uh, there was a letter to from Henry Miller. You know, just you know, he like his um because in my book, um, mm. Marty spent a lot of time trying to get you know the Henry Miller back in print. You know, the Tropic of Cancer especially and. That's right. And, and so there was a lot of trips to Big Sur. And um, so Henry Miller has a letter to Ginsburg. Don't don't come here. You know, I can't. You know what? I have to admit, I don't even remember what that letter said. Was it provocative? <laughs> yeah. Was it not suitable for airplay. I can't even remember. <laughs> but, I, but I remember reading, um, you know, like, uh, I mean, that was what was good about Ginsburg. I mean, he went he met Pound. He went to France and met uh uh, Louis Ferdinand Celine, you know, they, they have all mm -hmm. these great experience. I mean, like, um, I mean, something about literature, it's, it's sort of tactile. I mean, you have to meet the people. It's, it, I think it's, it's so, even if you don't, you know, I think you got to meet the people like Ginsburg and these people just in, in some way, even if you, if you're not on the same trip as them. Well, you know, here's the thing that makes Ginsburg, you know, a lot of, of writers, especially writers that famous, they think the world revolves around them. Ginsburg is really a fan of other writers, Russian poets, uh, Dylan, of course, Patty Smith, you know, so as much as, as, as much success and fame as Ginsey had, he liked meeting other people that were talented and see what they had to say to him, you know? Right. There's a guy that uh, shows up, um, Alan Anson. He was around during the Moroccan years. And, and That's like, right. What, what, what was he, he? I guess he published a couple books. What, what was his, do you know much about him? Alan Anson, if I remember correctly, was connected to Brian Geisen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and Brian Geisen and Alan Anson were, you know, kind of came up with the idea of the cut-up technique that Burroughs later did, where you would you'd write a novel and then you cut it up into little pieces and then throw it up in the ground and then piece it back together. Um, and I think Alan Anson was also into recording, you know, in other words, the idea that you could sound is an art collage and and this is where mccartney comes in because mccartney bought those guys a tape recorder so they could play around with this stuff you know and anson was a brit yeah i think he was a brit yeah okay okay so uh yeah one of my favorite parts of the book is like all the you know because you, you kind of because i met ginsburg in the 90s and saw him read a couple times and uh and then you know you get all you know you see these he, in, in the films, he's rolling thunder with Dylan. And so you kind of see him as this kind of aging hippie kind of per, persona. But yeah. in the book, you have like a lot of these great pictures from the 50s. And you kind of like forget that, oh, yeah, you know, back in the 50s, he just looked like uh, kind of a regular New York dude. He did. He did. He did. Intellectual. He did. Yeah. Intellectual. Yeah. Columbia University grad student vibe. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And then and then the book goes on and. and it, I mean, he went to India in 62. This is like five years before the Beatles and a lot of these people. So he's That's there. exactly right. He's there real early. And, and uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, here's the thing about Ginsburg. 
he helped start the beat movement. So he's a very influential beat generation guy. He's a proto hippie. As you said, he went to India five years before the Beatles. So he's very much part of the hippie movement. And then, you know, the punks embraced him, you know, like working with the Clash or whatever. So he's he's really covers the 50s, 60s and 70s and is important sort of to all three decades, I think. In, in the 70s, um, yeah, he kind of became more focused on uh, going to Colorado and starting Europa. Uh, you, you have a lot of pictures for, and documentation from that time? Uh, years. Some I kind of talk about how Naropa came together. Um, you know, Naropa is a little bit of a mystery to me because I've never actually been there, but I know that it combines writing, obviously, but also with B Buddhist thought. You know, because there's you could you could go to Naropa and work with Western writers like Ginsburg and Waldman and Corso. I think you can also Naropa and study meditation. You know, so there's obviously a diverse group of monks and, uh, you know, white people, you know, <laughs> coming together, for lack of a better word. You know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, that was kind of like uh, my interview. It kind of started because my contention was, um, I mean, I, th I think I, I, I thought he was Ginsburg was a little bit of a charlatan as, as far as Buddhism and eastern thought that he you know i think you have to really be immersed in it and not just kind of um half go yeah. halfway but I, well, I i know what you're saying i mean i don't think ginsburg considered himself a monk because he wasn't I, I think i think him and to a lesser degree kerouac you know they dabbled in this um you, you know i i mean i can't i can't fault him for it i, I think his interest in the culture indian culture and the and the culture of meditation was sincere, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. but I, I, I think it's, um, I mean, some of the people that actually went to a monastery, like Leonard Cohen, or um, right, or right. Gary Gary Snyder, I think. Well, Gary, yeah, Gary's. If if, if we're going to pick one beat, who's the real <laughs> deal on this Eastern religious or spirituality thing? It's it's Gary. I mean, Gary wound up moving to Japan. Um, yeah, he's 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 probably the Zen master out of all the beats for sure. Yeah, and uh, so like uh, I also read the um, there was like an insert that's just like pages of Ginsburg notes. What's that about? Like, uh... well, you know, we wanted to kind of come up with something that like absolutely. I mean, most of the book is stuff that nobody's seen, but we wanted to come up with something that was sort of in Ginsburg's voice. So we found like thirty pages of a of a notebook where he was typing rather than writing. And one of the things that's in there is a couple previously unpublished poems. There's him listening to Dylan's Blood on the Tracks for the first time. And then there's even a couple pages of his of his phone book, right? Like there's very oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, other sort of counterculture celebs. You can see their 1974 phone number, you know. <laughs> right. Okay. So getting back to what I was talking about before, I mean, we 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 both um uh like uh because I, I i spent so much time um on grove and stuff and that that was definitely a counter i mean there was like the main culture was like norman mailer and yep. uh uh gore vidal and those, those guys, those guys and yeah. divey, divey league guys and like you know the beats and richard brodigan and others were sort of or even other people were were like were Okay, we're going to create this interesting counterculture. We 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 ex accept uh, who the hell's calling here. <laughs> you know, we're, we're we're you know, and um, can I can, I mean, Barney and and Allen Ginsberg and others like uh, definitely embrace this counterculture. We're going to do something. I mean, it was almost outside of college until he got to Europa, and still that was sort of a countercultural college experience. I think you know too. Well, well ever. Evergreen Review, the magazine, yeah, is really almost like an academic journal for non-academics of the era, right? Because you've got these thinkers like Norman Mailer in there, but you've got people like Ginsburg in there. There's political thought. There's Bernadine Devlin who helped lead the, uh, you know, the the uh, Northern Ireland sort of revolution or civil war, if you will. Uh, 
you know, there's a little bit of softcore porn in there. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of something in there for everybody, but it's it's mostly politics and literature. You know. Yeah, it's it's kind of like some people have described it as kind of like an early version of Saturday Night Live or something, or 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 like before the the National Lampoon. It was like, yeah, my it's not meant to be funny, but it, but it has a similar audience. I mean, if you were reading the Evergreen Review and you had a little bit of sense of humor, you were probably also reading National Lampoon in its early days, you know. And and Saturday Night Live, I think you make a good point. Early Saturday Night Live is a spinoff of the counterculture in many ways, for sure. And uh, wh wh where is the counterculture now? It seems like through the internet, it seems like everybody's uh, aiming for the mainstream. It's not like, it's, it's not like they're kind of like saying, oh, there's the mainstream. I don't have anything to do with that. I'm like this. Everyone wants to be successful uh, American Idol type thing. You know, they don't want to be, they don't want to be this kind of interesting kind of, Countercultural thing, you know. At you all. know what it is. I think nobody wants to do the work, as you know. Writing books is hard, or doing a magazine is hard. People just want to post on Instagram and have ten thousand people go, "Oh, you look cool," right? Like nobody <laughs> wants to actually do the heavy lifting. You know, I mean, you might people might not agree with Jerry Rubin, but he was famous for actually doing something. What the hell has Paris Hilton actually done? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. Well, I mean. Uh, and we, um, I mean, we were both born in the 60s. So, I mean, we have like a lot of the same kind of cultural references. I mean, we yeah. went to school, we read books, you know, we were, I guess they call it the Gutenberg mind or something, you know, like. Something uh, like that. Yeah. A little what, bit of what what, is that word? dididactic. Di like like when, when we go to, a, when we do readings and stuff, we have pages or books and stuff. We don't read off an iPhone because that would be like pretty silly. Yeah, and I don't carry an iPad with me. You know, I carry a notebook. Um, are you are you now like in the South Bay of LA or like where? No, 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 no. Uh, Orange County. Oh, okay. So you're okay. So you're below. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Why was that? I, no, I just I think you when I when I first came to when I first came to LA ten years ago. I think I think you were living more in the heart of the city, but I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah, I was in downtown, and I was also I lived in uh, around the Grove on Fairfax for a while. Sure. Like, uh, like probably when I saw, it. yeah. I mean, I mean, like I see you at like a defender Ben Hart or like the three o'clock or whatever. Every time <laughs> they play, and I go, oh, I've known this guy like for almost forty years now. Yeah, yeah, dude. We're we're long overdue to 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 meet up or or do an event together or something. So, so, so I see your books. I'm like a fan of all these books. Uh, I mean, uh, the hey, I mean, and then the heyday, and I mean. Yeah. I A and R like one record for um a less E R, you know, English folk singer, you know, but that's yeah. I haven't had much record uh experience. I mean, you were doing it for like at least 10 years or more. You know, are you are, are you're you're still doing it today, probably. Oh yeah. No, I mean the mu the music business is still my day job. I mean, I'm I'm a manager of the Dream Syndicate now. Uh I've been helping the Rain Parade get back together and record a new album, you know, st stuff like that. So the, the heyday legacy continues for sure well, what's going on? yeah so the dream syndicate like has that whole movie now that's right we're putting that out on dvd uh early january so there's a lot of stuff so uh so you got so the jerry rubin books out the um uh black panthers mm -hmm. the yeah. lou reed ernie lou kovacs ernie this kovacs book. just came out a few months ago this yep. book, the dream syndicate what's what's next what are we going to look for next well, that big, I'm doing a giant evergreen review coffee table book. Okay. Uh, I just interviewed Stanley myself, um, Stanley Gorski. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and there'll be, you know, more dream syndicate, you know, more, uh, oh, uh, some, you know, unreleased Sandy Denny from Fairport convention. Um, yeah, you know, I've yeah, always because, got stuff cooking. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Dream syndicate seem like they're kind of, um, I mean, I mean, they're really kind of going for it. They're, they're kind of like almost, it's almost like a new band almost the last couple of years. That's exactly right. And, um, you know, where the, where the, maybe the Bengals and three o'clock just seem kind of stuck in the eighties, you know, they're, they're, um, you know. Yeah, the are making new albums that, that are a little different than what they were doing before. You know, they're constantly moving forward. There's a little more of a, Roxy music, art rock element in there that was never in there before. A little some proggy, 
elements even you know so the yeah the dreams are gonna keep moving forward for sure and uh yeah yeah they're yeah they're great uh, i gotta check some of the stuff oh there's a baseball project too i've seen a couple times yeah they're fun i'm not a baseball guy but they're fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so like if people want to get your books where, where where should they go i mean you used to have that room uh 124 thing or whatever yeah that's called. that unfortunately went down Basically, everything I've done, I, I hate to say it, but everything I've done is on Amazon. I know that's okay. not people's favorite way to go, but Amazon is the easiest way. And then, frankly, if, if and I think somehow you and I became disconnected on Facebook, but if people yeah. follow me on Facebook, there's always. Okay. A... Okay. So I'll put a link to Facebook and Amazon and to uh, yeah. there's, and a, there's, face... a, there's a Simon and Schuster uh, link for this book. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, let's re, let's re. I think we somehow. I think maybe you your Facebook account went down and you started a different one. Yeah, I started a different one. Yeah, I think you might have be the old one. Yeah, um, yeah. I I I might have deleted you like when I I I I just felt like I I had too many friends. I felt like no, no, that's I, fine. You had a purge. I do it. Sometimes. <laughs> Let you, me. You, uh, yeah, I'll re I'll re add you. I was just yeah. looking at your page and seeing if uh what was going on. So yeah, there's a Simon and Schuster. And um yeah. Well here you are. Yeah. Editor in chief at Portable Infinite. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay, I'll add friends. Okay, there you go, brother. Okay, so let me okay. now there's another guy on here claiming to be Alexander Lawrence from from LA, but he's into basketball. I think. Oh okay, that's not me. Okay, but th yeah, there's some there's a guy with the same name spelled the same way that's in Japan, but he's like a musician or something. But anyway, I just I just sent you a friend request, so we're good. Okay, that's good. Okay, so um, thank you, yeah, man. That, yeah, check out these bo these books. Um, yeah, um, it's called Material. What's it called again? Material Wealth: Mining the Personal Archive of Allen Ginsberg by Pat Thomas. Yeah, check out this book. I mean, I look forward. I look forward to the Evergreen. Uh, did you talk to um, uh, who's uh? uh ken jordan did you ken jordan yes i did yeah yes. good memory yeah good well job. i've hung out with all these guys like um yeah ken jordan and mike top and all these guys uh, all the we, yeah we'll do we'll do a fresh interview when, the, <laughs> when this comes out yeah That's ken a... jordan i used to see him in like when i fly to new york to la i used to see him in the airports all the time and i go oh because like he's he just seems like he's all over the place yeah, yeah, that's why. What a small world, man! I love this. What a cool connection we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're kind of, we're kind of like yeah, because like, and I interviewed uh, Stanley Gintarski just a couple months ago. Because we we're it was more about Beckett. It wasn't really about the um, Evergreen, but uh, I mean, right. Stan, Stanley is like the the top guy on Grove. Here it is. This <laughs> and that book, and, I, and, and in that book, I did the um, Feltrinelli interview. Oh, fantastic! Um, I transcribed it. I didn't do the actual interview. Barney did. Barney did the interview. That's okay. That's okay. It's all good, brother. And okay. uh, yeah, that's that. Yeah, Gintarski and um, yeah, like um, wow, good. So let, let me here. Let's we gotta. So uh, yeah, buy the books, everybody. Okay, thank Thanks you. In the description, no, no, Alexander. No, no, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna keep it going here. Let's see. Okay, here. man. Let's okay. see. How do we? God, it's like this thing's like so difficult. Let's see. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Let's see.